Welcome to OmniFocus Workflows with Jeffrey Tickman, and uh, thanks to everybody who's joining us here live, and uh, thanks to, I'm sure, the many people who will be watching a recording of this. Uh, if you're new to Learn OmniFocus, this is a site that I started uh, back in 2014, right after OmniFocus 2 for Mac was released. And it's really uh, grown over the years. We've got um, an active community. Uh, people have joined from over, over 60 countries. Uh, there's a real international presence. And um, there's lots of free content to, to check out on the site if you're not already a member. And if you do want to join, you'll have access to the full content and can also come to the, the live events. So uh, before we get to, uh, to Jeffrey's webinar, I just want to talk a little bit about a few things that are coming up soon. And uh, starting with the very next webinar, and it's called Getting OmniFocus Back on Track. And uh, something I hear from a lot of people is that um, they started using OmniFocus with great enthusiasm, and then after you know, maybe a couple of months or a year, however long it takes, uh, the system maybe gets a bit bogged down and they don't use it as much, or maybe even abandon it altogether. So we're going to be delving into that topic and uh, talking about how you can keep OmniFocus uh, on track and if you do kind of fall off the, the wagon, how to how to get back on. Uh, and this is inspired by what I was looking at the Google Analytics yesterday. Since the very start of uh, Learn OmniFocus, this has been one of the most popular articles and talking about common OmniFocus pitfalls. So we'll be using this as a, um, as a framework for the webinar going through each of these. And uh, this will be an interactive one, so I'll encourage you to, to come live if you're available and actually go through your own OmniFocus setup as we, as we go through the webinar. And even by the end of the webinar, uh, hopefully you'll be inspired to, um, to uh, get things back on track and you'll have already made some, some progress in that direction. So that'll be taking place on Wednesday, April 12th. And that'll be from 10 to 11.30 Pacific time. And if that time doesn't work for you and you're finding in general, uh, you're finding it diff diff difficult to come to these webinars, definitely let me know and, and send me an email with some, uh, some times that would work well and I'll definitely take that into account. So uh, just before we get to Jeffrey, I want to talk a little bit about um, a course that I've been leading for almost exactly three years now. And this is a the holistic productivity course for, for Mac and iOS. Um, this uh, takes place over seven sessions. So there's 12 hours of uh, interactive time in a video conference setting. Um, and it goes over a four month span. So we really, really have a good chance to integrate the, the material in the course. Um, the, uh, each course has what's called a productivity pond, so there's up to 10 people in each group. So you really get to know the other people in the group well, and, uh, and there's certainly been friendships that have developed out of the course, and people continue to keep in touch uh, once the course is done. Uh, so I go through productivity principles, including my own holistic productivity approach. Uh, with David Allen's permission, too, we also go through the, the, the basics of getting things done, or GTD. And uh, we also go through how to apply these principles using some best of class productivity apps for Mac and iOS. Uh, so these are some of the ones that are covered in the course and I imagine um, everybody's using OmniFocus and you're probably using some of the other ones as well. Uh, so the next course starts on April 19th um, and it'll wrap up on August 2nd. And if you wanna get a taste of the, the material and the, the group environment, um, you're very welcome to come to one of the fundamentals workshops that's coming up later this month. Uh, so there's two available, uh, March 22nd, that'll be from 12 to 1 Pacific time, and then on March 29th from 10 to 11 Pacific time. And uh, the cost of those is a very affordable cost of free, so that'll, uh, that'll be something where you can experience that group environment, uh, learn the, the basics of holistic productivity, and uh, help to let you know if the if you want to go further and do the four month course. So if you want to register for those and learn more about all of this, you can go to holisticproductivity.net and then it's forward slash calendar. And without further ado, I'd um, like to take a moment to introduce uh, Jeffrey Takeman and really happy that he agreed to, to join us today. He's uh, 
been using OmniFocus since OmniFocus existed, and even before, as you might might share in a, in a moment. Um, I could probably spend the rest of the hour talking about all his accomplishments, uh, but I'll just highlight a few, and I'm sure he'll be talking a little bit more about that. Um, he's an assistant dean for educational technology and the director of the Human Simulation and Patient Safety Center. Uh, he's a neuroanesthesiologist at the Duke University School of Medicine, uh, faculty in the Duke Clinical Research Institute, and last year he enrolled in the uh, University of Arizona's Integrative Medicine Fellowship, uh, which is directed by Andrew Weil, who's, uh, you might uh, recognize that name, he's a real pioneer in, uh, in the field of integrative medicine. So if you want to uh, learn more about uh, Jeffrey, you can go to jeffreytakeman.com. And uh, on the productivity side of things, he's got a uh, blog, uh, wiPPP.com, Workflows in Personal and Professional Productivity. And uh, he's got a lot of great uh, OmniFocus content as well as um, covering other, other apps on Mac and iOS. All right, well, without further ado, I'll uh, pass it over to you, Jeffrey. All right, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I I thought I just, um, that was a great introduction, so thank you. Um, the, one of the fun things about my job is I get to do different things every day. Well, some days I'm clinical, some days I'm more administrative, some days we're doing research. Um, and so that's one of the fun things I enjoy about my job is a variability. Um, but it also, each one of those different roles, um, I have lots of different things going on at any particular time. So. Um, my journey in, in um, OmniFocus was actually one of survival. Um, I found myself really struggling to keep up with everything I needed to do with all my different roles. And so I started searching. So, um, you know, I thought I'd tell you a little bit. Um, the search actually began before OmniFocus um, was a, uh, a product. And so um, on my blog, which um, Tim pointed out there, I talked about um, an, the method that I used before OmniFocus, which, which was getting things, uh, I'm sorry, First Things First by Stephen Covey. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar with it, um, there are a couple of key things that I took away from it. The, the first one was probably the most important, which is there are tasks, but um, there, you, you can really break those tasks into one of four quadrants. Um, if you think of uh, the different quadrants, um, you can break them apart based on their importance and their urgency. So um, Covey talks about quadrant run one being um, both urgent and important. Um, quadrant two is important, and I, I choose to define important as being important for my long-term success. Um, but quadrant two is, is important, but not urgent. Um, quadrant three is urgent, but not important. And quadrant four is not important and not urgent. Um, and so um, that was one thing I took away from that book. That was sort of a revelation for me was not everything people asked me to do or things that I wanted to do had equal importance. Um, and so I found I could start um, um, basically prioritizing my, my tasks that way. Um, but it quickly became confusing. Um, and so an another take home point from that, those books was breaking down the various tasks that I had to do into um, the, the various roles that I play. And each of us do different things, both in our personal and professional lives. Um, and so um, I used that system for, for quite a while, and I still um, was not completely happy with it. And then Getting Things Done came out, and I, I read that book uh, probably around 2004. I don't remember when OmniFocus first came out, but I remember some people had hacked together um, software using Excel and other things to start using some of the principles and getting things done in a a computer format. So I started trying those out early on. Um, was very excited when OmniFocus first came out and have been a user since it was first released through both versions. Um, so I, my system 
I think you're going to see, um, knowing that background is a combination of first things first and getting things done with a little bit um, of agile programming thrown in as well. Um, so just a little bit of um, the philosophy of what I do and don't put in, in OmniFocus. Um, for things that have become habits, I tend to keep them out of, of OmniFocus. So Sunday is my day that I, I know I will do a weekly review. Um, I know I will sit down each evening and plan out my following day. I tend not to have a, um, an action that reminds me to do those things. If it's something that I don't do on a regular basis or something that's relatively infrequent, um, then I will put it in OmniFocus to remember me uh, or to remind me. Um, I also don't use due dates very often unless I have a hard, a hard due date. So, uh, for instance, in the United States right now, our taxes are coming up. Um, they're due April 15th, and I have to get information to someone to prepare this for me. So I have a, a drop dead date of the 15th of March. So that type of deadline actually goes into OmniFocus, but many of my other projects do not have one. Things like grant deadlines do, um, manuscripts that have more of a rolling deadline do not. Um, I also do most of my um, work on the computer, most of my planning on the computer, but most of my accessing of my lists on mobile devices, either my phone or my iPad, uh, typically my phone because that's usually with me. Um, and uh, I'll show you, um, so I, I use OmniFocus, um, but one of the other revelations about the software that I found is the ability to use um, text is and use that in various perspectives that I've, I've started using that quite a bit actually and I'll show you some of that um, usually I, I review what I'm going to do the following day and I put a flag on the materials that I want to use the following day um, and then I have a context I'll show you that brings up my material um, that what's due either a hard due date or something I've flagged that I need to get done that day. Um, so, I, you know, using that context, um, I think that's that's basically where I'm coming from. Um, my OmniFocus, um, I have some text expander scripts that um, do some of the tagging, especially the text tagging, and I can talk about that if you're interested. Um, I tend to capture a lot of information using Siri. My, my morning commute's a good time for me to think of new tasks. And um, so I, I have Siri um, capture my tasks and import those into the inbox in, in OmniFocus. And I use that quite frequently when I'm driving and thinking about um, things that I hadn't thought about the evening before. And I'm also a big fan of AirMail, the, um, the software email package primarily for the context that takes an email imports it into OmniFocus but also tags the OmniFocus task with um, the location in the airmail database so you can go back and forth between the two. Um, I'm still searching for a good Pomodoro timer. Tim and I have talked about that a little bit um, and then Evernote is a big part of my system as well and then an add-on for Evernote called, called task task clone um, that I can um, tag something in Evernote. It shows up automatically in OmniFocus. I'm going to show you, um, this is my projects layout. So uh, I have four highest level um, project folders and I call one weekly priorities. I have my single tasks and then I have my projects and what I call meta and I'll dig down into each of these. Um, so in the weekly priorities, I have a maintenance folder, um, and then I have my weekly priorities. So getting back to um, first things first, and this is also, I guess, has some background in Agile as well. Um, you know, I figure out what are the three projects that I really want to get done 
this week? What are the thing, three things that um, I really want to work on this week? Um, and I tend to try and keep, again, from, um, from um, first things first, Stephen Covey recommended that you try and spend the vast majority of your time working in quadrant two, which is projects that are not urgent, um, but very important. And so the majority of these, um, I put in some of these, you'll see um, my taxes I would consider both important and urgent. So that's a, a, a quadrant one project. Um, and then I have some, some learning stuff I had to do um, for my, my clinical duties. Uh, and then I've been working on this, this presentation as well. Um, this on deck folder, uh, and I can go a little bit further into each one of these if you're interested. The on deck folder is if I'm ultra productive and I get everything done in my top three categories, then I start digging in into this folder. So I basically have six projects, um, a, mo a highest priority folder I, I really need to get accomplished. That's my goal. I'm happy when I get those three things done. And if I'm ultra productive, I start digging around in my, my on deck folder. Um, now, I, I pulled this database out of my real database, but I've erased a lot of the, the actions in, in each one of the different folders here. So um, that's my weekly priorities. My single tasks are things that really I can't categorize as a project, and everything goes into that folder um, that is not a, a project. Um, my project folder, I break down into two, two different um, subfolders. One is, are my professional roles and one are my personal roles. So if I dig into my professional roles here, these are the various roles I have. Um, you know, each one of us has different professional roles, um, but a minor as an administrator, a clinician, um, a communicator, consultant, fundraiser, innovator, entrepreneur, learner, mentor and teacher, researcher, society member, um, and writer. So you, you could probably organize these in different ways. Um, the writer, there are certain um, topics that probably could be combined in certain ways, but these work best for me. And then in my personal folder, um, I've got a fun folder. Um, and then the various roles I play in my, my personal life. So I guess it's not a financial role, but I could be the, the family banker or the, uh, the chief executive officer of my family. I don't, uh, whatever you want to call it. My wife would probably have a problem with that. But um, so again, the various roles I have. And then some of these have subfolders as well. So personal development, um, Tim mentioned I'm, I'm um, in, a, uh, a program for integrative medicine at University of Arizona, um, I consider that personal development. So, um, and I've broken even those down into to further projects at all. Um, and then as a project comes up, a new project comes up, when I add it to OmniFocus, it, um, it comes down to the bottom here, underneath Meta, um, and I will quickly categorize it into one of these subfolders, whether it's a professional project, and I can quickly put it into any one of these subfolders. And you can see I, in each one of these different folders, I have various different projects. So um, Tim was just mentioning one of the, the issues is people get overwhelmed with how much information is in there. This is a way of keeping those projects organized, and it's a way of also emphasizing or de-emphasizing certain parts of, of my life and the roles that I play. So it works very well for me. It's, um, I think it's a little bit different than I've seen what other people do. Uh, and then finally, I have this meta folder, which I keep my Sunday maybe projects in here. I also put my completed and dropped projects in there. The Sunday maybe stuff, I'm constantly collecting manuscripts on various things I'm working on as research projects, um, or if I'm writing a manuscript. So I'll have, anytime I find something, I don't have time to, to get it at that time. It'll go into this, uh, into this folder. The same with files. 
I have a, a separate one for files. Um, and then um, these someday maybe projects. So these are things that I've, you know, I may have thought a little bit more about, but I'm not ready to commit to doing it at the particular time, but they're sitting in a queue in the someday maybe projects um, folder. So that, um, those are basically my folders. Um, I'm in and out of OmniFocus on my iPhone constantly during the day. So my typical day, I would sit down um, the evening before and I would, um, again, think through the different quadrants and I would find um, the tasks that are most important to get done. So I would do that in a weekly review. Um, so you can see all my various projects here. I haven't done my weekly review on, on this dummy setup, but um, in here, um, this is where I do my housekeeping, housekeeping each Sunday. Um, but then each evening I sit down and basically decide um, which projects I'm going to work on um, and which tasks I want to accomplish the following day. So I can do that by going into my weekly priorities. Um, there are various ways of getting that information and I, you know, I can actually look at each one of the separate things, the things that I actually want to accomplish the next day, I'll, I'll flag. And then I have a context that shows flagged or due by context. Um, and I, I don't have a context for the stuff I set up for this, but um, this will show me um, of those high priority tasks, the different contexts um, of things that I can do to get those projects done. So I find that very helpful. Each Sunday as I'm planning, um, I use these note boxes. So I've got two text expander scripts. As I'm looking through the project and planning the project, I'll put these tags in. Um, the two important, not urgent, is the, the COVID quadrant um, that this project corresponds to. Uh, and then the other thing I found is um, I do a lot of my really, my best work, my most creative work in the morning. So writing grants or writing manuscripts. Um, people laugh at me in my office because they can almost set a clock by the time I get up and start walking around, which is around 3 p.m. Um, I, I really cannot concentrate enough to, to do, get much writing done. So um, what I've started to do recently is not only tag these quadrants, but also use an, another text um, tag, how much energy is going to um, be consumed basically doing that project. So energy consumption things would be manuscript writing or research. Um, low energy things would be downloading um, manuscripts from the internet, um, making a phone call, those, those types of things. So I found these are, are very helpful um, when I, I kind of look inside and say, how much energy do I have to get something done? If I have a low energy, I can actually pull up a list of low energy things I, I can get done. Uh, just one question on that. Uh, is this something you put onto every project in the database or, or is it just certain projects that would get, get these tags? I try and put the, um, the Covey quadrants on everything I do. I try and categorize it as I, I, uh, as it enters the database. Uh, the energy consumption, I've started doing that more recently. Um, so it's not on everything in the database. Um, and would these just be on projects or might you assign these to actions in some cases? Actually to actions, um, yeah, that one's on a, a manuscript. So um, I believe, um, so yeah, typically it would be actions as well. Okay. Um, so the, the Kobe quadrant would be for the project itself. The energy um, could vary based on what you're trying to do in a, in a different project. So, Because um, you might have an important, not urgent project that's got a like high energy consumption or low energy consumption action. Right, the actual, the actual writing might be high energy consumption, but... Um, writing the cover letter might be a medium um, or 
uh, reviewing the requirements for submission would be a, a low energy requirement. All of those tasks have to get done to submit the paper, but they would vary within the project. Okay, got it. Um, and then up here are my different perspectives. Um, so these are the different quadrants, and I can pull up um, my important urgent tasks very quickly. Um, taxes in this database are the number one priority, um, and so on and so on. And I, again, I really try and work the most in this quadrant. And then, you know, I, I can parse things um, by the amount of time. It, I, I probably use my my quadrants the most. I have been using these energy consumption uh, more frequently. I rarely use the amount of time. Um, these, those are from early days when I started using OmniFocus. Um, and, um, but I do spend a lot of time with this sidebar. I spend a lot of time looking especially at my priority um, projects. And I've got the perspective um, that will give you weekly priorities by project, um, the weekly priorities by context. Um, so I, I break it down in, in various different ways. But, you know, it probably takes me about an hour, maybe an hour and a half on Sunday to, to get a grip on, on the week. I sit down with OmniFocus and a calendar um, to try and figure out what I might be able to get done that week. And then each night I tweak that plan just a little bit based on what I've gotten done that day and what I need to get done the following day. And do you actually schedule time for, for these projects? Do you put time blocks in the calendar or do you just I kind do. of know that you're, you're going to make some time for them? Um, so I think that probably breaks with some of the GTD gospel, but um, yes, I've found um, especially scheduling writing time is very important. Otherwise, if I don't schedule that time, um, something urgent always seems to come up that will take it away. That, um, so I almost make an appointment, um, and people are very good about honoring it if it's on my calendar, but if it's people see it as free time, um, it's not as, as, uh, as protected. Yeah, it makes sense. And what if you were able, like, well, let's say you finish 2016 taxes today, would you put another one in its place or take something from on deck? What would be the, um, yeah, so I the would move there? On deck. I tend to just leave them in, in the folder. If I finished, I would just hit completed. It will disappear, but I tend not to move things around. I would just move down into the on deck folder at that point. Okay, so Sunday is really the the time that you define the the top three for the week. And, yep. Yep. And if I'm ultra, ultra productive and I get through the priorities folder and the on deck folder, then I can start digging down into my other my other quadrants. And I would I would just pull up this perspective to find other projects I could be working on. Because presumably if something was urgent that'll be um, in my priority folders uh, for that week and I'll have completed them so I can work on something that's not as urgent that's important. We had a little look at your context, but it'd be great to hear a bit more about how contexts fit into the system. Yeah, so contexts um, are, I think, relatively simple. So, um, you know, calls, um, something that I want to defer um, the people that I would delegate to normally. Um, I do a lot of editing of other people's stuff, so I have a context for that. I'm tending to use my voice more when I'm writing, so I have actually a context for dictate, which um, I'm using different technology uh, to, to write papers and, and, uh, and grants now. And then follow-up um, email, uh, geofenced is just you know a, a location um, that's set. Um, I set up these work contexts, but I um, never use them. I would say work 
I keep it as simple as work, but I really don't drill down into these other contexts. I probably should eliminate those. Um, I'm not sure why bank is showing up here. Um, so these should all, uh, these are the geofence, that's why. Um, and um, then I have a context for making a project. If there's something I know is going to take a while to plan out, I'll just put in a placeholder with the context of make a project. Um, and then I'll come back to that either that evening or more likely on Sunday when I have some time to flesh out what actually needs to get done. Online, um, primarily buying online, um, paying online, so my tuition or my kid's tuition, um, buying online would be things like Amazon. Uh, and then work would be collaborative work online. Um, reviewing uh, information, so I'm, I may be asked to um, review manuscripts in the peer review process. So I have a separate context for that. Um, reading is, I, in my own mind, that would be my own, uh, my own reading for research of manuscripts. I use Slack quite a bit for various uh, project management. Um, I have a context for things I want to put into Slack or things that need to go into Slack. Um, I rarely break down my tech into Mac or iOS. I think that's too granular. It usually just gets labeled as tech. Uh, and then waiting for would be a project I've said to some, or, or something I'm, I need to uh, hear back about um, before I, I'm basically stuck until I, I get an answer or hear something from the person I'm, I'm waiting for. And then writing, which consumes a fair amount of time. Yeah, nice. Uh, and would you, in your your live system, would you have a context on everything, or do you uh, just leave that field blank in some cases? No, I actually have it set up so I can't clear uh, my inbox until I have a context as well. Okay. So yeah, I have to have um, both a project and a context, or it won't clear my inbox. Okay, got it, Jim. Yeah. So I do try and set up a context for everything. Uh, one one thing that I find a lot of people struggle with uh, is the weekly review, and uh, it sounds like you're you're very consistent in doing that. Do you have any suggestions on building consistency, or what what has helped you to to really make that part of your your weekly routine? Um, well, I've I've found if I don't do it, my week is much less productive. So. Um, there are some weeks where it seems like a chore to sit down and do it, but I've really found that it, it, um, I'm happy I've done it towards the end of the week because otherwise, again, I think if you don't plan stuff out, then life just happens and, um, it may or may not be in, um, support of the most important things in your life. So... I've really tried to make it a habit um, and I try and do it consistently on the same day. I can't say it's the same time, although it usually does end up being pretty consistently Sunday mornings. Um, and I think that's really helped me having it a fixed day in my mind and knowing Sunday is basically planning day. So that um, it's, it's just become a habit over time. Yeah, okay. And it sounds like you're totally sold on the concept, so it wouldn't make sense not to do it. To, versus I, I find a lot of people think it's just kind of an extra chore to go through, but in your case, it sounds like it's time that's really well spent and the week's going to go and be much more productive if you put in that hour, hour and a half to, to do that. Well, I think it's also true about it having a, a calming effect because you, I think you feel more in control of everything that you need to do when you've thought about all the different roles and you've had a chance to think about what's most important to you that week. So it, I think it also is a control and kind of a anxiety killer um, sitting down to do it and not, um, not having to think some things are in the system and some things are out of the system. Knowing everything I need to do is in there, I find it um, really helps leave anxiety about the stuff I need to, to accomplish. 
if I haven't done one in a while, I have this anxiety about what I'm not paying attention to or what's going to fall through the cracks. And so it's, yeah, it's time, time well spent for sure. Uh, we have a question from, uh, from Patrick. Uh, he was just wondering how task clone fits into your system. If you could expand upon that a little bit more. Yeah. So, so task clone is a clever uh, program in, in Evernote. If you import an, a note into Evernote and you put a checkbox next to an item in Evernote, then you use the tag in Evernote um, called task clone. Task clone actually communicates with OmniFocus or any other um, planner, and it takes the checkbox from your Evernote account and puts it as an, an inbox item in OmniFocus. So, um, for instance, I'll use it when I'm traveling and I scan a receipt. I can, um, you know, if I don't have the person I need to send that receipt to, say I'm a visiting professor somewhere, um, I can. I can scan that receipt and in Evernote just put a checkbox next to it. Um, so I've, I've scanned, I have my receipt in Evernote and then I can put in a reminder to mail that when I get back to my computer and have the address I need. So I found it's, uh, it's very handy. It can be a little bit flaky at times because it's dependent on two systems synchronizing. So you have to be patient and, and task clone actually recommends you don't tag the ta you don't tag it with their task clone tag until you've completed your note because what'll happen is um, if you aren't patient enough you'll get um, problems with with synchronization it will actually um, lose synchronization with your database and you'll get an error message and you'll have to go back and resync at a later time so it's I found it's helpful, but it's not it's not a perfect setup, but it, it really helps save a couple steps when I'm doing things. Uh, the other way I've used it is if I have a lot of literature that I want to download I that's been aggregated in some way and I don't have time to do it, I can just put a checkbox in front of each one of the different papers and it will um, then synchronize with OmniFocus. When I have a chance, I can grab those one at a time um, from OmniFocus. So those are low energy tasks. Um, it's, I think it's a clever program and it's very flexible. Um, I just wish the synchronization wasn't as wonky. Do you find things eventually end up in OmniFocus or, or do you really need to kind of follow the guidelines they set out to be guaranteed that it's going to um, show up there eventually? It does show up. It, and you can tell when it's synchronized because it tags it. Um, you can customize the tag that it places in OmniFocus, so you can act, uh, so you can actually see when it's synchronized. And they recommend you don't mess with the note until you see that tag. So oh, you, can, okay. you can tell when it when it's synchronized. And I, I use it, um, but it occasionally will take. I'm not the most patient person sometimes, so sometimes it'll take a little longer than I would like to synchronize. Okay, thanks, Yeah, And if you haven't seen Task Clone in action, that was one I covered in uh, the Automating OmniFocus webinar, so you can just go back and check that out and, and uh, walk through the, the process so you can see how it works. And they've also got a, a video on their website showing the OmniFocus sync in action. Yeah, and I found their, their tech support's been very good if I've had a problem. They answer, they tell you they'll answer within 24 hours, but they answer much more quickly. Okay, fabulous. I'm curious if you use defer dates at all. Uh, so if it's a task that, let's say, can't be done for another three months, would you would you defer it out or would it? Uh, I rarely use the defer dates. I will use them occasionally. The thing... Um, that I, I haven't figured out how to do is to make them completely disappear. A deferred date shows up as a grayed out item in my OmniFocus um, database. Um, and so I really have not used those um, primarily because I haven't taken the time to figure out how to make them disappear uh, when I use a deferred date. But if a project comes in with a hard deadline that I really don't want to think about, for a month, I wouldn't use a deferred date, but I use them very frequently. Okay, cool. And the short answer there is just setting the available settings. So if uh, 
if you've got it set to remaining, it'll show everything that's incomplete. And if it's set to available, it won't show anything that's been deferred off to the future. Eric's wondering if you use a someday, someday maybe context, or is that something you put on a single action list? Yeah, that was in your, yeah, your meta folder, I remember. Yeah, so I, yeah. I don't use the someday um, as a context. I actually use it as a folder. I started out using it as a, a context, but then I found um, it would interfere with, with planning of the project. So I ended up using the using a folder. I'll throw everything in the folder, so I do not use a someday context. Especially, you know, for those projects that I've already partially fleshed out, they're someday projects, but um, here, if I pull one up here. Uh, oops. So, um, you know, it wouldn't work for for some of these. If each one of these was a someday context, I couldn't put in um, the other the other context that I would actually use when I do that project. So, this works for me having a folder rather than the someday context. If it was make a project, I you know it was a single item. I suppose I could use a someday context um, and just put that into a single folder without fleshing it in and out. And these, I assume, would be across all areas of life, like anything is fair game for that folder? Yep. Yep. And how often would you typically go go and look at those items? Would it be part of the weekly review? Or? Yeah, I look at them each yeah. week. Yeah. Uh, I have mostly manuscripts in there and um, there each, each one of those is something I'd like to write, um, at some point, but there are so many other things going on. Um, I haven't done it, but yeah, I would put, um, travel that I might want to do or other things would might go in that folder as well. Okay. Got it. And I guess you're using the review mechanism to make sure that you don't forget about what's in there. Yeah. I look yeah. at it pretty much every week. Every week. Okay. Do you have everything set to to a weekly review period, or there's some that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think my, my biggest problem is with the single tasks. Things go in there. I'd say that part of the database gets the most out of control out of my whole database. Single tasks. Oh, within the okay, because they're all that's across all areas of life. I'm assuming. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. It gets to be a pretty long list, I imagine. It can be very long and it can be tedious then to review every week. So, um, yeah, I, that, that grows the most of any of my, my folders. Yeah. Okay, cool. And my general approach to that is if, uh, if a single action list is getting too long, it probably makes sense to break it up. And if it's consistently very tiny, then it might make sense to make it more general. So it's, just keeping, keeping the size of the list manageable and, and relevant, I think, is useful. Uh, and then there's a question uh, from Patrick about, uh, he's wondering if you find nearly everything ends up in quadrant two. Um, and if that, if the, if, if there is sort of the bulk of things in there, kind of where do the other two quadrants fit in? Are there three yeah. quadrants? So that's, that's one of the dangers of sharing your database with, <laughs> with other people. So, you know, that um, I try and keep the majority of the stuff in quadrant two um, because of the various roles I have. Sometimes um, there are urgent things that come up that I have to do, but I wouldn't consider them important to, you know, uh, to my personal growth. And so I would say probably 80% of my, the things I try and put in there are in quadrant two, um, but there are always quadrant one things that come up. And unfortunately there are quadrant three things that come up not infrequently as well. And I rarely get to quadrant four stuff, which irks some people, but um, there are only so many hours in the day. So um, I've gotten a lot better at saying no than I used to be to, uh, to projects and, um, you know, I think that's an important part of that as well as, is accepting, um, 
what's important. I mean, we all have to do things we don't necessarily want to do. Um, but learning to, to say no really has helped uh, straighten, uh, made life a little uh, more pleasant, I guess, than it was at one point. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And it sounds like just the act of tagging a project is something that has you hit the pause button for a moment to just evaluate, is this worth my time and energy? Yep. Um, yeah, so it's even if, and it, it makes sense that a lot of things would be in that quadrant too. And uh, ideally for a lot of people, I think that's not the case, but uh, it sounds like that's how one, one way you measure if you're on the right track is just making sure that that quadrant two has the bulk of your, your, your stuff going in there. Mm -hmm. And for things like uh, paying the taxes, which you might not decide not consider quadrant two necessarily, but uh, uh, it sounds like those things will rise to the top just through the use of due date. So they're they're going right. to show up in your show up on your list, uh, even if you don't kind of deem them quadrant two worthy. Yeah, that's for me. The taxes are quadrant one because they keep you out of jail. Oh yeah. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Uh, and I'm just curious how many things you have flagged at a, at a time. Uh, you mentioned you go through your yeah. weekly priority and so forth and flag specific yeah, tasks. A typical week, you know, I would guess I have 25 or 30 things when I sit down on Sunday. Um, that list will shrink as I start accomplishing things. Um, the way my schedule works, I'm usually clinical certain days of the week and non-clinical. So... Um, I tend to check off more things on the non-clinical days. The, the clinical days are pretty well consumed um, by, by clinical care, although I might be able to, to get some low-energy stuff done while we're waiting for cases or other things are going on. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so it sounds like, yeah, the energy is, is the, the key piece there. And so having things that are in quadrant two, but they could be low or high energy and being able to distinguish between those two. Yeah, if I had um, if I had multiple tasks um, that I, I was looking for a low energy task and I had to prioritize which one, then I'd, I would look at a quadrant two task, a low energy quadrant two task to get done over a quadrant three or quadrant, especially quadrant four. Uh, and uh, one question I always like to ask is, uh, what feature is missing? Because I know the Omni Group will often uh, at least listen to recordings of these sessions. It's a yeah, so one of the good chance I've, to put in a feature request. Yeah, I'm, um, I've been looking for years now for a good integration with a Pomodoro timer. So um, I really, I like using a Pomodoro timer. And at one point there was a product called Excellent that integrated very well. I would it worked well with my workflow because if I tag something in OmniFocus, it would show up in the timer. Um, that is no that program is no longer supported, and um, Focus that you recommended to me actually will let you export tasks from OmniFocus uh, into Focus, which is a step closer. But what I'd really like is to be able to. Um, flag things within OmniFocus and have them automatically imported into a good Pomodoro timer so I, I don't have to take that extra step of setting up the timer to work on tasks. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, I definitely would make good use of that as well. Um, any other apps that you use alongside OmniFocus? So you mentioned the ta task clone and and the, uh, the timer yeah, app, uh, or the focus app, rather. Yeah, Are there any other ones? The I use for some of the, um, some of the uh, text scripts, so tagging the different quadrants. Um, I'll use a text expander. Um, I have one. It's uh, dot CQ1, CQ2, CQ3, CQ4, the different quadrants. Um, so, yeah, I use text expander quite a bit. Um, and then the airmail is my mail client. Um, there are some things I don't like about airmail, but the one thing I love is the ability to, uh, to take any task uh, or take any email and import that into OmniFocus. And airmail is smart enough to tag the email um, or tag the task in OmniFocus with a link back to 
the airmail database so you can find that email again from your task and on your focus. So I, I use that quite a bit. And that's made me stay with airmail for, um, for a while now, even though some of the other things I'm not as big a fan about. And are you using airmail on both Mac and iOS? I am, yep. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah. And they continue to develop the app too, so that there's a, it's definitely in, in active development. Uh, we talked briefly before we got started too about OmniPlan, and you mentioned that that's something you use on some larger projects. I do, uh, so. Yep. Yeah, so especially for grants, I've got like a checklist of all the things that need to happen um, when I'm submitting a grant. And it's, that's in OmniPlan. Um, so it's basically a, a time a timeline, but I can export um, OmniPlan and get that into OmniFocus. Um, so what I've done is set up the temp template in OmniPlan. I'll set up the dates. Um, I'll do every the setup of that project through my template, knowing the deadline of the submission for the grant. Um, and once I'm happy with that, I'll import that into OmniFocus. Okay, nice. Yeah, we've had quite a bit of interest in uh, having some material here on Learn OmniFocus uh, that delves into OmniPlan. So that's definitely something that's uh, planned for the future. Uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, Omni Outliner, I'm curious, uh, is that something you use quite frequently? And how does that overlap with OmniFocus? I use it some. I probably... Um Primarily, I've gone back and forth with mind mapping versus outlining. I've been using um, something called Tinderbox a lot more recently um, for outlining. Um, so I, I use Omni Outliner some, um, but some of the features of Tinderbox, I wish Omni Outliner had some of the features of Tinderbox uh, because the visual interface is much better. The interface of Omni Outliner is much better, but Tinderbox has some incredible features that um, I'm only now discovering. So, What would be one of the, the ones that you sort of number one choice for Omni Outliner, just to go on a slight tangent here? But I would, oh. Yeah, um, in terms of a new feature, new support there. So, um, yeah. I mean, I've, um, from an outlining standpoint, I guess some of the mind mapping features, um, you can do it there, but it's more of a visual mind mapping would allow me to do away with current mind map software that I use. Because when I use mind mapping, then I end up importing it into Omni Outliner at some point. So it's a two step process. And then I'll do the rearranging in Omni Outliner, but I quickly move it out of there into Scrivener and start writing. So I don't spend that much time in Omni Outliner, but if, if it had some of that visual component to it, I could probably do away with another piece of software. I want to uh, say thanks to, to Jeffrey for, for being here today. And I certainly have got some, some ideas to take away with them, especially intrigued on tagging the, the projects according to the quadrant. I think that's a, that's a great exercise to go through. Um, also, I really like the idea of the, the way you move projects into your weekly priorities because I think it's, it's uh, so easy to kind of lose track of um, important projects if they're, they're buried under a folder structure. So that's a really nice way of declaring them as important. So definitely, uh, definitely some great uh, food for thought. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope to uh, hope to see you all at the, the next webinar. As always, if you have any requests for any topics that you'd like me to cover, definitely uh, don't be uh, shy about dropping me a line through the, the contact form, or you can also email hello at uh, learnomnifocus.com. Okay, so thanks again, everyone who joined here live, and uh, thanks to everyone who's watching your recording. And again, thanks to, uh, to Jeffrey for taking some time out of his busy schedule to, uh, to share, share his OmniFocus workflows. Take care.